welcome you to another Veritas class. And as we come together uh, one more Sunday, I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 John. 1 John chapter 4. The title of the class today is Discerning the Spirit of the Age. And I want to read this passage together in 1 John chapter 4 and draw some practical lessons and implications that will both encourage you and challenge you in your Christian journey, especially as we continue on in our course that we've entitled The White Flag When Compromise Cripples the Church. Look with me at 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. John the Apostle, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Last week I introduced to you a, a German word. It is the word Zeitgeist, which is translated the spirit of the times or the spirit of the age. And I want to remind you that the Zeitgeist is alive and well in our culture. This seditious monster seeks to undermine, weaken, and threaten the church. This subversive activity is, is done in the shadows, and it works relentlessly to sabotage and incapacitate God's people. Done correctly, the church of Jesus Christ will not even recognize the damage or discern any noticeable difference. Martin Luther is one of the few Christ followers who early on recognized the devious and malicious nature of the zeitgeist in the days of the 16th century. He wrote about it in his well-known work, The Babylonian Captivity of the Church. It was the current author, Oz Guinness, who rightly identifies this weakness as, quote, a falling for the spirit, style, and system of the age, which is also a worldliness and an unfaithfulness that both saps the strength of the church and brings it under the judgment of God. Close quote. Martin Luther saw the devious ways of the zeitgeist and he warned the church to flee from its diabolical ways. Listen to what he said in the 16th century. He said, Beware, therefore, that the external pomp and works of the deceits of man-made ordinances do not deceive you, lest you wrong the divine truth in your faith. You see, Martin Luther was quick to identify the zeitgeist during the formative days of the Protestant Reformation. He went on to say, See how far the glory of the church has departed. The whole earth is filled with priests, bishops, cardinals, and clergy, yet not one of them preaches so far as his official duty is concerned, unless he is called to do so by a different call over and above his sacramental ordination. The relentless reformer fulfilled his biblical duty and thus discerned the spirit of the age. The church benefited greatly from his godly wisdom then and continues to benefit from his godly wisdom in the present day. Last week we learned about how the apostle Peter identified false prophets and false teachers in the days of the first century. Now the Apostle John describes what we may refer to as a battle-ready position. And he establishes two very important benchmarks that will enable you and I to discern the spirit of the age. I want to invite you to also turn in your student workbook to page 15 and also invite you, if you have not yet received a workbook, 
or if you have stumbled onto uh, this YouTube channel and you're brand new to this class, I want to invite you to also send me an email at baldreformer at gmail.com and I would be happy and pleased to send you a PDF of the student workbook. On page 15, we notice the first broad heading, namely that we are to distinguish between good and evil. This is the first imperative. This is the first command in 1 John chapter 4. And the first imperative, the first command, involves distinguishing between good and evil, and it may be stated as follows. Do not believe everything you hear. Don't believe everything you hear. Notice the key words, do not believe. The Greek term translated believe means, quote, to render a statement as true, to be persuaded in the truthfulness of something, and in this case, the spirit of error. My friends, this is the reality. We distinguish each and every day. Whenever we pull up to a stoplight, we distinguish between red, green, and yellow. Whenever we eat dinner, we distinguish between the meat and the potatoes, between the vegetables and the dessert. Whenever we go to the grocery store, we distinguish between brands. Some of us opt for the name brands. Others of us who are more frugal, we opt for the generic. When we search for a hotel to lodge in for the summer vacation with our family, we distinguish between the affordable and the expensive. When our children bring home their report cards, we distinguish, we distinguish between an A- minus and a C+. Plus. Hence, in the Christian life, we must distinguish between good ideas and bad ideas. We must distinguish between good theology and bad theology. We must distinguish between good philosophy and bad philosophy. We must distinguish between the beautiful and the profane. Whenever someone sets forth a worldview or advances some sort of ideology as followers of Jesus Christ, we must evaluate each and every one of those ideas through the lens of sacred scripture. Philosophy, writes R.C. Sproul, forces us to think foundationally. He goes on to say this, foundational thinking lays bare all of our assumptions so that we may discover those assumptions that are false and often lethal. And so the Bible calls you and I to distinguish between good and evil ideology, ideology rather, for this reason. Ideas have consequences. For example, there was a book that was penned back in 1859. It was a book that would gain uh, almost instantaneous notoriety and it would influence many generations to come and continues to influence most Americans and people all around the world to this day. When Charles Darwin published The Origin of Species, he threw down the gauntlet and he cast a radical new vision, a naturalistic worldview which has gained ascendancy in most universities and continues to compete for the hearts, the minds, and the souls of people to this very day. Darwin's ideas, however, have massive consequences. His worldview influences the way we view mankind, his purpose in the world, and the final destiny of mankind. The worldview you see of Charles Darwin leaves no room for a personal creator and it ultimately renders man as the final arbiter of truth. It was Frederick Engels, the co-author of the Communist Manifesto, who writes, quote, in our evolutionary conception of the universe, 
There is absolutely no room for either a creator or a ruler. Unquote. Engels' worldview, then, is a direct reflection of the ideology that Charles Darwin promoted in his book in 1859. Clearly, then, ideas have far-reaching consequences that impact our view of God, authority, man, eternity, and our final destiny. One additional figure I would turn your attention to, that is the example of Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood. Now, Sanger, as some of you know, was a, a proponent of eugenics. This is defined as the, quote, self-direction of human evolution, unquote. A notion that is similar, if not identical, to Darwin's so-called survival of the fittest. And so, like Marx and Engels who preceded her, Margaret Sanger was influenced by the worldview that Charles Darwin promoted. It was Faye Waddleton who served as the president of Planned Parenthood from 1978 to 1992 who wrote, quote, We are not going to be an organization promoting celibacy or chastity, close quote. Once again, this should serve as a massive wake-up call for followers of Jesus Christ. It reminds us that ideas have consequences. Ideas have grave consequences. Whenever we fail to distinguish between good and evil, we give evil a foothold and we unwittingly surrender ground in the Christian race. Losing ground is always the first step to losing the war. We must therefore follow the lead of the Apostle John. We must first and foremost, distinguish good from evil. But there's a second thing we must do, which is found on page 16 in your student notebooks, and it's also found in our passage in 1 John chapter 4. We must not only distinguish between good and evil, we must discern truth from error. This is what you might refer to as the second imperative and the, or the second benchmark that the Apostle John establishes in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Read it once again with me. John says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Oftentimes you will see this happening that the, the wolves, the theological and philosophical opponents of historic Christianity will mix truth with error. Ravi Zacharias warns, quote, when you mix falsehood with truth, you create a more destructive lie, close quote. All the more reason for you and I to discern truth from error. Now, the second imperative is a logical extension of the first imperative that we just examined. That is, test everything you see and hear. John's directive means to determine the worthiness of something. In this case, we test the spirits, we test the worldview, we test the ideology to see whether or not they are from God. What's fascinating here is that Paul uses the same word in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21, when he writes, But test everything. Hold fast to what is good. It was the late British pastor John Stott who observed, So behind every prophet is a spirit, and behind every spirit is either God or the devil. Before we can trust any spirits, we must test them. My friend Tim Challies highlights the importance of discernment in the Christian life, and he utters these words. He says, Discernment is the skill of understanding and applying God's word with the purpose of separating truth from error and right from wrong. It was King Solomon who 
presented this amazing request to God that reflects the heart of what it means to be a biblical follower of Christ. Listen to his request in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 9. He said, Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to govern this your great people? And then God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches of life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 11. And so I hope you see that in our lives, in our Christian journey, we are constantly making judgments. We discern every day. For example, a quarterback discerns as he steps up to the line of scrimmage. As he steps up to the line of scrimmage, he, he looks left and he looks right and he, he looks at the linebackers, he looks at the secondary, he looks at every defender on that field. He discerns. He carefully evaluates his opponent and he makes the necessary adjustments in his strategy before the ball is snapped. Likewise, a sailor discerns as he meticulously evaluates the weather patterns and makes necessary adjustments to his travel plans. And a physician also discerns as he or she evaluates the health of his or her patient and monitors their all-important vital signs. This leads us to the third heading in your student notebook, namely discernment in the Christian life. What does it look like? This is what I like to refer to as the responsibility of every Christ follower. And there are several things that we need to unpack here together. Number one, discernment is a learned skill. Discernment is a learned skill. This is not something that you are born with. This is something that is not innate. This is something that needs to be learned. And so learning to discern is a skill that takes a great amount of practice. Developing discernment takes time to cultivate and it needs to be nurtured on a daily basis as you mature as a follower of Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 2 verse 8 admonishes believers, See to it that no one takes you captive by hollow philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Now, the Greek term uh, blepo is translated see to it here, and it involves the process of careful discernment. The imperative here means to, to weigh carefully. It means to examine something closely. And there is an urgency that is also attached to this command. It would be like crossing the piranha-infested Amazon River. Your guide would cry out, Watch out! Or, Blepo! Keep your hands out of the water. Or in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus said to those around him, Watch out! Or, Blepo! That no one deceives you. In Mark chapter 13, verse 5, Jesus said to them, See, or blepo, or watch out that no one leads you astray. And then in Mark chapter 8, verse 15, he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, or beware, which is actually translated from blepo, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Scripture warns us about falling prey to spiritual deception. It warns us to beware of the subtle influences of culture that threaten to undermine the church and do violence to our souls. The challenge before each Christ follower, then, is to nurture the skill of biblical discernment, to view everything through a biblical filter, all to the glory of God. Nothing escapes our watchful eye. Every book, every magazine, every movie, every television show, 
every conversation, everything that we come into contact with, we are called to be discerning followers of Christ. But there's a second thing. I want to remind you that discernment takes discipline. We must stand our ground. We must be alert. We must repudiate lazy, lackadaisical, passive Christianity, which I would argue is on the rise and is worse than we have ever seen in the history of the church. Paul reminds us to discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. And there is an intentional link between discernment and discipline. That is to say, disciplined Christ followers are discerning. Undisciplined people are both undiscerning and disobedient. An important aspect of developing discipline, discipline rather, is to be constantly aware of our surroundings. Our challenge is to constantly monitor the world that we live in. It was Russell Moore who highlighted the importance of this special mindset. Dr. Moore says, quote, the world system around us, the cultural matrix we inhabit is alien to the kingdom of God. With different priorities, different strategies, and a different vision of the future. Moore writes, if we don't see that we are walking a narrow and counterintuitive road, we will have nothing distinctive to say because we will have forgotten who we are. Close quote. Such vigilance not only preserves our salty influence in the culture, it prevents a pitiful marginalization that is so common among Christians in our days. On page 17, I want you to see that discernment is about making judgments. Now, when I utter the phrase, making judgments, most of you will freely admit that making a judgment call on anything in our culture is automatically a source of controversy. You see, the postmodern mind not only recoils against authority, it resists the notion of distinguishing between truth and error. But the Word of God calls us to judge in this respect. The Greek word here means to separate, that is, to judge. There's another word that means able to judge, and still another Greek word that means to, to carefully examine or judge. And so, for you and I, making judgments, much to the chagrin of the postmodern world, is not only an important aspect of the Christian life, it is vital to your Christian journey. Number four, being a person of discernment makes its final appeal to the Word of God. And this too is a controversial point because it makes its appeal to a higher authority, which is to suggest that one is holding to an absolute standard, namely, and here are the words that no one likes to hear in our culture, absolute truth. Christians who cling then to the authoritative Word of God should be prepared for unrelenting backlash and persecution. But that does not distract us from being people of the truth who make our final appeal to our highest authority, that is God's holy Word. Number five. Being a person of discernment assumes there is a right way and there is a wrong way. The Greek word dakamazo means to, to prove or to examine, to discern or to distinguish or even to approve. The term describes something that demonstrates the, the worthiness of something. Listen to Romans chapter 12 verse 2. Paul the Apostle says, Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may, dokamazo, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13, Paul says, For the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, 
and the fire will dakamazo. It will test what sort of work each one has done. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, Paul continues, Let a person docamazo himself, let him, let him examine himself then, so as to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Christians who exercise discernment must believe then and embrace the law of non-contradiction. Too many evangelicals these days want every person to be right. They want every person to be right, and such a view is utter nonsense. Such a view is not realistic, and such a view, moreover, does not accord with reality or the way that God created the world. And so by definition, a person of discernment affirms and maintains a distinction between right and wrong. Finally, being a person of discernment assumes that truth is objective, not subjective. It implies that truth, by definition, is exclusive. And that exclusive truth binds the conscience of every person. Of course, some things in life we realize are subjective. I was reminded of this several years ago as I remember taking my kids on an ice cream outing. My daughter got a scoop of cappuccino in a cup. My son got a vanilla soft serve, his all-time favorite. I tried a new flavor, coconut almond bliss. And now each of us enjoyed our ice cream, each of us enjoyed our treat, and each of us was convinced in our hearts and in our minds that our ice cream was the best. And incidentally, the coconut almond bliss was the best. But you need to understand at this point, there is no absolute standard of truth that can be applied to ice cream and baseball organizations or hamburger restaurants. When it comes to matters of epistemology, however, or the nature of truth, we recognize, we recognize that there is an objective standard of truth that must be ruthlessly applied. The fourth heading, which appears on page 18 in your student workbook, is entitled, The Tests for Exercising Biblical Discernment. And the Apostle John supplies two specific tests for doing so in 1 John chapter 4. Remember that we are called to discern truth from error. Therefore, we are primarily concerned with the ideas people put before us and the philosophy which is peddled and promoted in the marketplace of ideas. So notice, finally, those two tests. Test number one, do they promote a blemished Christ? Do they promote a view of Jesus Christ that is in alignment with the Word of God? Do they emphasize Christ's humanity or ignore, deny, or marginalize his deity? Do they emphasize Christ's deity or ignore, deny, or marginalize his humanity in any way? Do they, with the ancient Gnostics, view the creation as evil and the spirit as good and as a result repudiate and reject the humanity of Jesus. Consider now the, the Muslim view of Christ. In a Muslim scheme, Jesus was merely a messenger of God. He was not the Son of God. In a Muslim theological framework, Jesus Christ is not divine. Islam, Islam maintains that Jesus Christ did not even die on the cross for sinners. Muslims agree on this fundamental premise, then, that Jesus Christ is not the final revelation from God. My, my friends, such a view distorts the portrait of Christ that we find in Scripture. Therefore, Islam promotes a blemished view of Christ. Or consider the view promoted by the Watchtower Society, more commonly known as Jehovah's Witnesses. The Jehovah's Witnesses maintain that Jesus Christ is not 
God in the flesh. One Jehovah's Witness publication says, and I quote, the true scriptures speak of God's Son, the Word, as a God, little g-o-d. He is a mighty God, little g-o-d, but not the almighty God, who is Jehovah, unquote. And so Jehovah's Witnesses openly and actively deny the deity of Jesus Christ. The French reformer, John Calvin, is quick to confront anyone who does not present a biblical portrait of Jesus. Listen to what he says. Those who rob Christ of divinity or humanity either detract from his majesty and glory or obscure his goodness. Close quote. The Apostle John responds with similar passion in 1 John chapter 4, for anyone who rejects the full humanity and deity of Jesus Christ is not of God. And he notes, this is the spirit of the Antichrist. The second test, do they promote a, biblished, a blemished worldview? What do they teach about God? What are their doctrinal commitments? Do they affirm the penal substitutionary atonement of Christ on the cross for sinners? Do they affirm the doctrine of eternal punishment for unrepentant people? Does God's word bind their conscience and compel them to live under the full weight of its authority? And are they, are they using their minds for the glory of God and submitting everything to the lordship of Jesus Christ? And finally, is their ultimate allegiance bound to the word of God or are they tethered to the frail tassel of human autonomy? These are questions that we must wrestle with. As we conclude, I want to remind you once again that the wolves are growling at the gate. And like the days of the first century, some of these wolves have infiltrated the local church. They have weaseled their way into the front doors, and like crafty snakes, they have slithered through the back door. They have wormed their way into positions of authority. They have managed to find leadership roles in crucial areas of church leadership. They have secured elected positions as deacons and elected positions as elders, and some of these wolves are serving as pastors. And their agenda is very simple. Seek and destroy. Seek and destroy. And these wolves have no regard for truth. They have no love for orthodoxy, and they pay no homage to a holy God. Indeed, we live in a day that is challenging. These are the days of the challenged church. We live in a day that is marked by theological error and apostasy. We live in a day where truth is maligned and contradiction is celebrated. And while many are rightly concerned with the prospect of, of terrorism or future pandemics, perhaps we should set our sights on theological terrorism, which has already infiltrated the church. Our task is this. It's to return to our first love. Peter Jones admonishes the church, quote, We must call all cultures and ourselves in every generation to the rule that judges all other rules, the rule of faith, the law of true freedom, the word of God, close quote. A cursory glance now across the cultural milieu reveals an unfurled white flag. That white flag has been unfurled and a, a diabolical deal has been struck. This white flag reveals a horrifying reality. And that reality must be addressed, namely that there is final surrender in the local church. This white flag, I'm convinced, if left unchecked, will in the final analysis, cripple the church of Jesus Christ. Next week, as we turn our attention to part two of our class, we will come to begin to realize some of the symptoms of the local church. 
May God bless you and may you um, continue to grow in grace and truth. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this uh, unique time together that while we are not physically together, we are growing together in grace even in the midst of the, this pandemic. I pray your protection over your people, that you would strengthen them, that you would encourage them, that they would uh, do as we have learned today, that they would be people of discernment. Grow them deep in the soil of your grace. Help us to be uh, wise. Help us to be prudent and may godly resolve as we are a part of this very important time in the history of the church. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.